Hello and welcome to my channel. Today, in this lecture, we will start the uh, abdomen series by studying the anterolateral abdominal wall. So let's begin. <clears throat> the layers of the uh, anterolateral abdominal wall, starting with the skin, then the superficial fascia that's uh, uh, that's also divided into uh, superficial and deep layers then a deep adipose layer deep to the superficial fascia with its divisions then the muscle layer then the transversalis fascia then the extra peritoneal connective tissue and peritoneum and then the abdominal cavity so this is the wall we will be uh, dealing with from the skin going uh, deeper okay okay after skin we have the superficial fascia it's composed of uh, a fatty layer uh, resting upon a membranous layer uh, this membranous layer uh, becomes very evident in the lower part of the abdominal wall but the fatty layer which is the superficial layer it's called uh, campus fascia it's uh, fatty and partitioned by septa uh, f extending from the dermis to the membranous layer and continues to the thigh beyond the skin crease actually uh, becomes uh, the superficial fascia of the thigh and in the midline on the genitals in males it forms the dartus muscle changes into smooth muscle fibers supplied by sympathetic called the dartus muscle uh, it's part of the layers of the scrotum and in females instead of the scrotum they have the labia majora so it's a constituent of the labia uh, majora the superficial layer the campus fascia the membranous layer it's uh, it rests on it's called the scarpus fascia scarpus fascia is thin above in the upper abdomen but becomes very evident in the lower abdomen becomes thicker and extends over the inguinal ligament to fascia lata uh, at skin crease of the thigh uh, it adheres with the fascia lata of the of the thigh the one the deep fascia we will study with the lower limb and uh, in the midline it covers the penis and continues as coolis fascia you will study this in the perine perineum especially in the perineal pouches and in females it continues into labia majora and perineal uh, fascia uh, lower down this is the scarpus fascia actually this is the one you see here dissected then comes the deep uh, fatty layer and the muscle layer as you can see here um, 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 it it forms um, a suspensory ligament either for the clitoris or penis and a fundiform ligament for uh, well evident of course with the uh, penis uh, okay so it forms the fundiform ligament and suspensory ligaments of the genitalia now deep to the scarpus fascia um, uh, we have the deep adipose layer uh, uh, it's strange that it's fatty it's fat cells is different metabolic activities than the superficial layer and it's the one preferred by the um, uh, cosmetic surgeons in liposuctions than the superficial layer that contains the vessels and lymphatics see here in this section you can see the campus fascia and the scarpus fascia deep uh, uh, deep to it and then the muscle wall okay uh, deep to muscle wall it's lined by uh, transversalis fascia this fascia continues upwards as infradiaphragmatic fascia continues downwards in the pelvis as pelvic fascia continues backwards as a thoracolumbar fascia so it's all actually one fascial layer but it takes different names in different regions of the uh, abdomen and um, attaches to as it descends attaches to the posterior border of um, uh, margin of the inguinal ligament and extends downwards as the anterior 
um, uh, uh, wall of the femoral sheath. We will study the femoral sheath in the femoral triangle with the lower limb. Okay, in the mid, in the uh, 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 around the opening in the external oblique, which is the superficial ring, um, uh, it uh, and the deep ring of the transversus abdominis and um, um, and uh, the internal muscle. Um, it continues around the uh, the testis as it descends from inside to the outside and continues as a sleeve of internal spermatic fascia. We'll study this with the structure of the spermatic cord. And um, instead of the spermatic cord in females, you have the round ligament of the uterus, so it's, it, it sends a sleeve, a sleeve around the round ligament of uterus in females. Okay, <clears throat> then after the transversalis fascia, a thin layer of uh, a variable amount of fat, especially condensed around the kidneys, which is the extra peritoneal connective tissue, and then we will be um, uh, dealing with the peritoneum. Okay, this is the full thickness of the abdominal wall. Uh, you can see here, this is the transversus abdominis, aponeurosis cut, and the transversalis fascia uh, is apparent in this window, from this window. And here, it's apparent as the posterior wall of the uh, inguinal canal, and uh, near the deep ring. Uh, okay. The muscle wall, the anterolateral muscles, Actually, there are big sheets of muscle, except in the midline, where it's a long, uh, a long stripe of muscle on the right and on the left. Uh, the muscles actually keep organs in place, uh, protect the viscera inside. Uh, when contract, they increase the intra-abdominal pressure, so help in uh, 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 situations we need an increased intra-abdominal pressure like micturition or defecation or in labor, for example. So, um, uh, also this increase in pressure can be reflected on, in, on respiration, so it aids uh, respiration by pushing the viscera, viscera up uh, to... Uh, uh, during uh, expiration to aid the uh, lungs in, um, you know, getting rid of the air inside. Um, the first sheet is the external oblique. It's a big muscle. C takes from the lower eight ribs, interdigitating with the latissimus dorsi and serratus and serratus uh, anterior muscle and takes from lower down from the outer lip of the iliac crest. The iliac crest um, is the upper margin of the hip bone and it has three lips, outer, middle, and interior. Uh, and inner, I mean, uh, lips of the iliac uh, crest. It takes from the outer lip. And from the back, it takes from the thoracolumbar fascia and comes forwards, the direction of fibers as if you are putting your hand in your front pockets, downwards and forwards. And um, um, not all the way it's fleshy, as you can see here. It turns into a membrane. It turns into an aponeurosis that uh, go anterior to the rectus abdominis muscle, the one dissected here, and inserts into the linea alba. This is the linea uh, alba. This is what happens um, medially. It uh, inserts into the linea alba, but lower down, the lower fibers, uh, after being attached to the iliac crest, they jump to the pubic crest and um, in between it thickens to form the inguinal ligament which is attached to the anterior superior iliac spine, the end of the iliac crest and the pubic crest as you can uh, see here and we will study this uh, um, in studying the inguinal canal because it's not just a thickening, no it goes backwards as an L-shaped ligament you know to provide the floor for the inguinal uh, canal and it also has an opening the aponeurosis see this opening this is the superficial inguinal ring um, the superficial inguinal ring see it's has two cruri 
has to query the superficial inguinal ring. The lateral one uh, to the pubic, attached to the pubic tubercle and the medial cross uh, to the front of pubis and they are joined by intercruer fibers as you can see here. Uh, transverse fibers to, to prevent the opening from uh, being extended. Okay, this is the superficial inguinal ring and uh, um, it belongs to the aponeurosis of the external oblique. Also observe here in the inguinal ligament, it has an extension attached to the pubic crest and the pubic pectin. It's called the lacunar ligament. See this triangular ligament? extension from the inguinal ligament lacunar ligament with a medial with a, a crescentic edge see lateral crescentic edge forms the medial boundary of the femoral canal it's a tight canal here between the lacunar ligament and the vessels the femoral vein and artery and nerve going down to the lower limb it's a site for hernia the femoral canal this is called the femoral uh, canal. Remember that and its relation to the lacunar uh, ligament. There is also an extension from the lateral crust to the linea alba, this in this direction, in this direction. It's called the reflected fibers or reflected part of the inguinal ligament to support the spermatic cord as it goes up, goes out uh, actually through the superficial inguinal uh, uh, ring. This is what happens with the external oblique. Uh, it's supplied by the lower intercostals and subcostal nerve, of course. Uh, the internal oblique, uh, deep to the external oblique, this is the internal obli oblique showing here. See, it takes from, from the ligament, from the lateral two-thirds of the inguinal ligament and the anterior two-thirds of the middle lip of the iliac crest and from uh, uh, posterior it takes from the thoracolumbar fascia uh, attaches to lower four, uh, four ribs but at the margins uh, uh, of the coastal cartilages this continu being continuous in plane with the internal intercostals actually i told you before it was one sheet of muscle and the ribs grew inside this sheet um, uh, okay and um, on its uh, the, the fibers on the way medially um, from the xiphoid process to uh, midway between the umbilicus and symphysis pubis the fire the aponeurosis it forms splits into anterior lamina and posterior lamina to enclose the rectus abdominis muscle so anteriorly above umbilicus anteriorly the anterior covering of the rectus abdominis will be one for external oblique and a half for internal oblique one and a half lamina okay and posteriorly it will be one and a half too because the other half of the internal oblique and the transversus abdominis aponeurosis and by this you would understand the walls of the rectus sheath this is in the upper region uh, i mean this is what happen happens to the aponeurosis of the internal oblique in the upper abdomen but in the lower abdomen it goes completely in front of the rectus abdominis it does not split and actually the site of splitting because of the splitting it forms the uh, uh, semilunar line or linea semi uh, lunaris uh, at the side of the rectus abdominis it's apparent on the outside as a groove longitudinal groove marking the lateral end marking the splitting of the internal oblique aponeurosis actually um, lower down uh, it arch arches medially see see the fibers arch medially to become posterior to the spermatic cord they were anterior to it first but then arched over it and then became posterior united with the uh, similar fibers from the transversus abdominis to form the falx inguinal or the conjoint tendon of the internal and transversus abdominis muscles actually this is it formed the roof of the inguinal canal by this uh, curve to the medial side 
okay and upon exit of the uh, the testis comes from the abdominal cavity outwards through the canal it takes sleeves and from the internal oblique it takes the cremaster muscle or cremasteric muscle around the spermatic cord and back to be inserted into the pubic tubercle thin fascicles of muscle around the spermatic cord and the cremaster muscle and its nerve supply is by the genital branch of the genitofemoral nerve a branch of the lumbar plexus than the one um, the plexus we will study uh, later during the uh, abdomen series okay um, uh, the cremaster uh, by its uh, you know distribution around the spermatic cord when it contracts it pulls the cord up and this happen happens in cold weather for example uh, like the testis must be pulled up for it to be uh, close to the warmer body for their function the optimum temperature for the for the testicles is 27 degrees i think yes it's below the body a body temperature and that's why it's uh, thrown outwards in the scrotum away from the hot body 37 degrees celsius um, there is a reflex involving the cremaster by rubbing on the medial side of the thigh l1 afferent a reflex uh, pulling up the testicle by the uh, contraction of the cremaster muscle. This is called the cremasteric reflex to examine L1. The nerve supply of the internal oblique, see the fibers, how it goes backwards, downwards and backwards, opposite the external oblique. Actually, the fibers are against each other uh, uh, to form a meshwork, and this uh, uh, increase the integrity of the abdominal wall instead of the fibers being parallel to each other um, this is the internal oblique and the last muscle is the transversus abdominis this is the transversus abdominis that comes from the inside of the costal margin lower costal cartilages interdigitating with the diaphragm and the neurovascular plane between it and the internal oblique the same like the neurovascular plane in the thoracic cage between the internal and innermost intercostals comes from the thoracolumbar fascia transverse fibers taking from the uh, lateral third of the inguinal ligament and the anterior two-third of the inner lip of the iliac uh, uh, crest and um, it goes medially in the upper abdomen it uh, goes behind the rectus abdominis and inserts into linea alba and below it forms the arcuate line as its fibers goes in front of the rectus abdominis so actually in the lower part of the abdominal wall midway uh, between umbilicus and symphysis and down uh, there is a redirection of all the layers of the three muscles to the front of the rectus abdominis making a defect on the back called the arcuate line and uh, the lower part lower one-fourth of the rectus abdominis posteriorly will be bare of lamina actually not covered by aponeurosis directly covered by the transversalis fascia you got it okay <clears throat> uh, medially it uh, goes also arches over the spermatic cord and together with the internal oblique form the falx inguinale and this falx inguinale inserts in the pubic crest um, uh, to be posterior to the spermatic cord medially it arched over superiorly and became posterior to the spermatic uh, cord it also the sends uh, extension of the lower fibers to the in, uh, uh, to the pubic ramus as the interfovular ligament it's a support for the spermatic cord from the back uh, during its course in the inguinal canal now by arching f um, uh, above the cord from lateral to medial it formed the upper boundary of the deep inguinal ring and the deep inguinal ring the surface anatomy is midway between the anterior superior iliac spine and symphysis pubis 
midway one and a half centimeters above the inguinal ligament you will be on the deep inguinal ring and this is if you want to test um, a hernia for example is it direct or indirect uh, so now you understand the uh, roof or the upper margin of the deep ring which is caused by the lower arching fibers of the internal and transversus abdominal muscle and you know it from the inside by finding the inferior epigastric vessels medially medial to the ring ascending on the abdominal wall medial to the deep inguinal uh, uh, ring okay together these fibers arching fibers of the internal and transversus abdominis they form when they contract they flatten so they go down compressing on the ring so uh, and the structure is passing so closing the ring this is called the shutter mechanism and that that's why these lower arching fibers take their own supply by l1 the rest of the muscle takes from the lower intercostals and subcostal but the lower arching fibers actually take directly from the ilioinguinal nerve which is l1 for their importance the shutting the shutter mechanism if this is paralyzed and they get paralyzed especially in mcburney's incision uh, some patients who did uh, appendectomy before uh, the incision wasn't correct so it cut uh, the uh, ilioinguinal uh, nerve as it pierces the lower arching fibers and enters the inguinal canal uh, this is um, this uh, this is uh, uh, this is a post post-operative complication of appendectomy the paralysis of the shutter mechanism the patient may suffer from um, indirect hernia uh, later passing through the deep uh, ring okay uh, the, that was about the, uh, the, the this uh, specimen just to show you the arc with line C at the back when the uh, uh, aponeurosis of the transversus abdominis was redirected anteriorly and it's deficient posteriorly see the rectus abdominis is bare of muscle aponeurosis posteriorly of course this is looking at the anterior abdominal wall from the inside with the peritoneum in place parietal peritoneum and seeing the folds in the peritoneum we will study this in uh, peritoneum the rectus abdominis muscle uh, now it's uh, completely different it's uh, ribbon uh, ribbon like extends from the thoracic cage to the uh, pubic bone it's broad above and narrow and thick below uh, above it takes from the five to seven uh, coastal cartilages um, uh, down to the pubic crest and front of the pubic uh, bone it gets enclosed in the rectus sheath we will uh, see the rectus sheath uh, um, um, in the next slide i think enclosed in the rectus sheath and it has intersections from the level of umbilicus up to the till the, the the xiphoid see the intersections the intersections they unite or fuse with the anterior wall of the rectus sheath but from the back if you look at the muscles from the back they have no intersections by the way the intersection is not complete it takes part of the thickness of the muscle it does not reach the posterior uh, surface of the muscle if you flip the muscle you will see see continuous flesh continuous flesh with no intersections at the back of the muscle means that the intersection is not uh, uh, for the full thickness of the muscle uh, see uh, the vessels and nerves enter the muscle supplied from the lateral side see that see the branches so in in the operative field uh, you do you do not retract the muscle medially you will cut the nerve supply so they always retract the rectus abdominis laterally and do not try to free it from the anterior wall of the rectus sheath because it, the intersections are adherent to the anterior wall no free it from the posterior side because it, it's not no intersections and it's not attached to the posterior wall of the rectus sheath uh, 
Uh, another muscle uh, uh, with the pyra- with the uh, rectus abdominis in the sheath is the pyramidalis, as the one you can see here, arises from the front of the pubic bone and inserts into the linea alba. It tenses the linea alba, and it has its own blood uh, nerve supply, the subcostal nerve, which is T12, the pyramidalis uh, muscle. Okay, um, the linea alba we've been talking about is the meeting of the, all the aponeuroses of the muscles we studied. It's in the midline, wide above and uh, narrow below. Uh, wide above umbilicus and narrow below umbilicus. Um, uh, umbilicus is at the level of L3, uh, adherent to skin and uh, structures passing in it like the erecus the uh, vitiline stalk and uh, ligamentum tears and the obliterated umbilical artery which forms the medial umbilical ligament all these structures uh, uh, remnants or remnants of structures are passing through the umbilicus um, the it's uh, it's a preferable site for the incision because it has less bleeding but the um, um, but the disadvantage of this, because of its less blood supply, so it takes longer uh, to heal, it have, uh, has prolonged healing time. Okay, so that's why some surgeons don't prefer the midline incision, they prefer the parasagittal incision or para midline incision. Okay. Uh, the rectus sheath, uh, from the study of the muscles, the external, internal, and um, uh, transversus abdominis, uh, we said that in medially, on their way to the um, uh, linea alba, the external oblique, uh, oh, anterior to the upper three-fourth of the muscle, rectus abdominis, the internal oblique splits into anterior half and posterior half, and posteriorly, the transversus abdominis passes to the um, linea alba, and midway between the umbilicus and the symphysis and uh, and the symphysis pubis, um, all three go anterior. So, actually, the lower part of the rectus sheath has only anterior wall that has the three laminae together. See, and there is no posterior wall of the sheath; the muscle is bare. And in the middle, till the thoracic cage, the one and a half and one and a half lamina. And on the cage, on the thoracic cage, since the external oblique extends over the thoracic cage, remember it takes from the outer surface of the lower eight ribs, okay? So on the thoracic cage, the, there is no posterior wall to the, uh, um, to the rectus sheath. It's only anterior wall formed by the external oblique muscle high up okay uh okay this is reg- uh, this is uh, uh, what you have to say about the structure of the rectus sheath contents is the two recti muscles see the, this is the rectus abdominis this is anterior wall and posterior wall the superior epigastric vessel see the see this vessel the superior epigastric, which is the terminal branch of the internal thoracic, and the inferior epigastric on the back of the muscle, the anastomose with the superior epigastric. And as you saw before, the lower intercostals and the subcostal nerve piercing the rectus sheath from the posterior wall and enter to supply the muscle after they supplied the abdominal wall uh, muscles. So don't forget also the pyramidalis muscle as a content of the rectus, rectus uh, sheath. Of course, the uh, limit for the uh, bare area of the rectus abdominis below um, uh, superiorly is the arcuate line formed by the redirection of the aponeurosis of transversus abdominis muscle. Okay, so the, this is what we have to say about the a structure of the anterior abdominal wall for this lecture and we'll continue uh, next time. I wish you all the best and thank you very much for watching.